to this month's ASJ GEMS Global Educational Meeting, some Vedra Crest, the exec executive publisher journals for ASJ and ASJ Open Forum. We've got a great session for you today. I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Amaka Nuba, who's a board certified plastic surgeon in Nashville, Tennessee, joining us and she'll kick off uh, with her slides shortly. Her practice is aesthetic and reconstructive surgery with a focus on breast and body contouring and breast reconstruction. She trained at University of Kentucky for a six year plastic surgery residency following medical school at Vanderbilt. She then did a one year aesthetic fellowship at the Aesthetic Center for Plastic Surgery. And she's a widely published author, peer reviewer, and with several notable plastic surgery journals, including ASJ, and um, is also the recipient of a PSF grant. She uh, finally is a social media ambassador for both ASJ and ASJ Open Forum. Welcome, Dr. Nuba. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce Dr. Roy and then we'll get right going with your slides. Uh, Dr. Roy Kim is a board certified uh, plastic surgeon specialist in aesthetic plastic surgery with a private practice in San Francisco, California. His areas of interest include breast and body sculpting, facial rejuvenation, and much more. He's a well-known lecturer and thought leader on many topics, including social media in plastic surgery, and has published in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Okay, so we'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Nuba, and thank you so much. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today about social media and plastic surgery. I definitely look forward to this, so my disclosures. Okay, so my disclosures um, are here, and then my, my disclaimer is that the views really are my own, represent my approach, but they have been um, shown to be pretty reproducible. Um, so I start off with this slide because it would, I would be remiss without mentioning these individuals and the impact they had on me. I knew very little about social media when I finished residency um, at University of Kentucky and I started my aesthetic fellowship. Um, I was on social media just socially with family and friends, but really didn't know much more. Um, and so these two individuals, Dr. Morales and Dr. Mentz, pictured here, are really the ones who um, sort of taught me about social media and how important it was and really said, Amaka, social media is it, and you absolutely need to be on social media and have a pres presence on social media if you are to get busy as quickly as you hope to get busy. Um, and my goal was to really be busy very quickly. Um, and so they really sort of showed me the ropes. Um, I never forget Dr. Mentz mentioning that essentially social media can essentially be like free pay-per-click, which I'll talk about some um, later on. Um, so just to start off with the introduction, these are the traditional ways to get busy. You meet the other docs, you meet the community, you do networking events, you take hospital ER call. Um, social media has changed us quite a bit because, as we know, um, we all experienced a time where we could not go out and do these things. And so essentially what sort of has happened um, with social media is that, and COVID, is that these were kind of taken away, not the hospital ER call. But um, essentially to get busy, a lot of time, many times what's required now is a strong brand and a strong online presence. Um, patients truly do background checking to see if you're even on these platforms and they are truly trying to get to know you and who you are before they choose you as their plastic surgeon. All these things, I, you know, I do all these things and done, done all these things when I started practice. However, nothing has gotten me busier than my online presence on social media. And of course, we talk about you know, doing good work, being available, being Apple, those are all important and social media just kind of, they it all kind of feeds each other. Um, so this is pretty much an outline. Um, we'll talk a little bit about branding, tips and tricks and about insights. I think that's probably the most important part is insights. I, I talk about insights in terms of reading the room. What are people liking? What is going on um, with your social media account? We'll talk about hashtags and we'll talk some about TikTok as well. So I want to talk about kind of where I started and where I am. Um, I started, so there's so many things that I noticed about when I, I took screenshots of these different points um, in my social media journey. So when I first started, I noticed there was rapid growth. So I was like, I just want to take a screenshot of this because this may be useful at some point. And then Phaedra asked me to do this talk and I said, uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, so I started off um, in 2019. At that time, I actually started my practice in October. So in August, I had started beefing up my social media. So you can see here at the 
you know, the followers kind of increased and, and that's all great. But truly what I noticed was the amount of posting increased. So you, if you look at uh, the 10, October of 2019 to August, roughly a, a little bit less than a year, um, I had about 100 posts. But if you look at the similar time period, I had over 200 posts. So the amount of posts I had increased. And the other thing you may notice is the content type. So truly the majority um, of people know it's an increase in, follow in followers, but truly what, I, what happened has happened over time is my brand has become more defined. Um, my content quality, quantity, and my bio improved. The bio is so important. When people go to your homepage, what is going to make them want, want to click follow? I always, um, when, whenever I'm talking to people about social media, I, I say, really think about why would someone want to follow you? Um, and so when you, when you look at it, I kind of have redefined myself. I'm a plastic surgeon, and that's very clear, but also I'm all these other things as well. I, I sort of embraced empowering women and being a doctor and, and talking about mommy restorations. And my link in my bio also changed um, to be a little bit more comprehensive. So when you think about branding, you have to think about it in several ways. You don't have to actually know what your brand is. And sometimes it's really hard to define a brand in one word. When you think about well-defined brands like Nike, it's you know, they have their just do it, but you think about so many other things like their commercials talk about so many kind of other aspects. So think about what are your goals? Are your goals, are you trying to get more patients? Are you, are you trying to build a brand that is truly monetizable? Who, who do you want to attract and who's going to manage your social media account? Those are all important things to think about and hone in on. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to all aspects in terms of if you're going to manage your own social media. I manage my, my social media personally. Um, and there are people who have other people manage theirs. There's no right or wrong way. It's the way that you want to do it that you're going to be comfortable with. For me personally, because I'm heavy on um, my brand being very authentic, it really made sense for me to manage it myself and respond to DMs and comments myself. And think about what you're trying to build. Are you trying to build loyalty, trust, a following, a brand? Um, a brand you know, when you think about branding versus bringing patients in the door, they're sort of two different things um, because people, some people may follow you, not even because you're a plastic surgeon, but because of the messaging, your messaging that you're giving them. When you think about your grid, that represents your brand. There's really not a right or wrong way, there's your way. But the important thing is to follow your insights, which I'll get to later. And essentially that's reading the room. You post, how do people, how does your audience respond to your posts or your videos or, or your reels or your TikToks? And giving them what they like is so important because when people go to your grid, that makes a decision for them. Are they going to dive deeper into the rabbit hole of your social media accounts or they're going to venture off elsewhere? So think about where do you start? So consistency is so important. So this is such an important place to start is consistency. Um, if people see that you post once a week or once a month um, or once every couple months, you sort of lose that reliability. Um, many times people are looking for someone to give them something they're looking to get something from you if you're not giving them you, you can lose people even though they're following you you may have still lost them so they don't pay as much attention when you post um posting and ghosting i always talk about you know when you post you know you want to be available for the next couple hours so you can respond to um, comments because many people are going to a lot of people spend a lot of time in the comment section more than you would ever, ever, ever um, think about. And also with branding, think about what you're giving your audience. They want to get something from you because truly you're looking for something from them, whether they're becoming a patient, whether they're going to um, subscribe to um, a book that you are, are recommending or buy a product that you're advertising. What are you giving them because you're getting something from them? So it truly is a give and take relationship, even though it's not as explicit. That's really what it is. Um, and it's really okay if you don't know your brand yet, you just have to start. Um, and then, you know, I, I thought, I think, like I thought when I was making this talk, I thought about J-Lo and Rihanna and what do they have in common? Well, they're both musical artists, but they also have ventured into a different space, a product space. And they've been able to do that because they have mastered branding and gaining attention. So think about what you're trying to do with your brand. Doing something where you're mastering branding and gaining attention to make yourself monetizable beyond one round, because they also realize that music was not a long-term thing and they could do more in terms of revenue with products. So just think about what, what your goals are. That's so important. And many times like me, I figured it out as I started, but the key is you just have to start. So I talk about communication and building rapport and trust with your audience. Um, and so I just had these screenshots from patients um, that would send me messages or make comments. So when you're in the comments and really getting in the comments with people, what happens is your own patients start making comments after they've had surgery. Um, one patient, like the one in the middle, 
sent me a message simply because someone told her that I reply to messages. So something as simple as just replying to a message um, is automatically getting you patience because they realize that, oh wait, I can kind of communicate with them and see what kind of person they are in, in the DM. So it, it's such a simple thing. It takes a little bit of time, but it is so worth it to get in there and really just communicate. And that's replying, replying to DMs, replying to comments. Um, I don't really have the time to go and like follow different accounts and things. So I really build my communication by replying to the comments and DMs that are coming to me directly. Um, and then this last one is the patient um, was looking for someone to settle with their spirit. So people, people are really looking to like get to know you. And essentially people are choosing their plastic surgeon before the consult. It's, it's, it's sort of a different world um, now. And so this one was, this one I took a snapshot of was really fascinating to me because this patient, you know, I, it was a time you talked before and after, and she's like, I'm so scared. And so I was just like, well, let's talk about it. <laughs> so then a patient of mine who had surgery jumped in and basically gave a, gave a review um, about her experience. So this is, I mean, essentially, I didn't really have to do anything, but again, everybody knows that I'm going to be in the comment section replying. And so we are having conversations in the comments. So many people go to the, these posts and they the post is great, fine. Most people click on the comment section and read through all the comments. Um, a lot of people do that. So this is so powerful and just an example of how important it is to just get in there and get to know your audience. This is part of brand building because part of your part of your brand may be that, oh, he or she is someone that replies to comments. And that can be a component of your brand is that you're getting to know people um, through the social media funnel. So some tips and tricks are organization is number one because we're all very busy, especially because I, I do all my own social media. So I batch produce a lot of content. So um, when you have like your notes section in your iPhone or your Android, whatever your choice may be, I um, have a section, essentially a social media section. And what I do is I actually have um, captions and I'll write, I'll think about a caption or idea and I'll just write the caption and save it. The other thing I do is if I'm in clinic and I see a, a great before and after that and a patient's willing to do a video, I'll automatically shoot a video and I'll save it to a photos or a video folder called social media. It doesn't mean I'm posting it that day or even that month. It's just content that I have. And what that does for you is that you're not sitting there on Monday thinking, what am I going to post? I have nothing. Essentially, by doing this, what you're doing is generating tons and tons of content that you can then, or, then later use and organize. And what I do is usually like, on a Monday morning, I'll kind of plan out my content and just think about what am I going to post this week? And usually I already have a lot of what I need. Um, you want to post when you have time. I mentioned posting goes to reply to comments. So like I don't post and then go do surgery um, because I also want to monitor the comments and make sure nothing's inappropriate or anything like that. So like just that first couple hours, I make sure I'm available. You want to set your times that you post to when your audience is, is active. So I do a lot of live streaming, and usually I do that early. So most people are not active, but I do that and save that. But if I'm doing a planned post, I look at my insights, and that's going to show you when your audience is active. So if they if they're active at 7 p.m., well, there's not really a point in posting at 2 p.m. You want to post when they're active because what happens with social media um, is that Instagram, TikTok, the post is shown to a group of people. If they like, if they're active they like it, then they start showing it to more people. And that increases your reach because then they start showing it to people that aren't necessarily your followers. Um, and then also thinking about stories versus grid. Um, the stories are great places just to put things that are very unfiltered sort of thoughts. And I do that. I use stories a lot. Um, and the grid thing about is your showroom. So when someone comes, when someone goes to the, you know, whatever car dealership and they look in the showroom, they look at all these amazing things, they decide, okay, is this where I want to park? <laughs> and so with social media, it's a similar thing. They look at your showroom and they think, is it, do I want to park here? Do I want to follow her? People really invest in this idea, like, do I really want to follow this person? The link in your bio is another really important one to think about. You want to make sure that this is something that is going to um, give your audience something, but also give you something. So if you link in your bio is like an article, that's great you know, using that for a period of time, but truly I, I eventually created a link tree. So people have all these options to go through, to go to from the link in my bio. They can request a consult. They can look, go to my YouTube channel. So this helps build my YouTube channel. Um, they can see live surgery. And so I, I kind of have adjusted that just to kind of help guide people um, to know they have all these options. When people visit your profile about 10 to 12%, at least from my own insights, 10 to 12% will actually click the link in your bio. Um, and by them clicking the link in your bio, which I'll show through insights, essentially that is pay-per-click because that's the idea is that they're getting to your website through social media, but it's actually free. So essentially it can become free pay-per-click. 
So jump into TikTok. Um, so the TikTok, as some of y'all I'm sure know, is videos, very short captions. It's capturing someone's attention in a matter of seconds. A lot of skits, super funny. Um, I have found, so I did my own case study. Um, so I was somewhat active on TikTok, but not really that active. I wasn't purposeful on TikTok in all, in all um, transparency. So I've been about 75 followers since March of 2020. So on September 3rd, I posted a video and I went to sleep. The reason I point out that I went to sleep is because I, like I said, I was not purposeful about TikTok. My purposefulness has been dedicated to Instagram. And so when I post, I don't go to sleep because I need to get in the comments and see what people are saying and, and things like that. So I went to sleep and I was like, okay, just another video on TikTok. So then um, I woke up to an increase of about 800 people overnight on TikTok. So then it kept happening. So this had over 14,000 likes. Now it's at like 18 and then like 1300 comments. So after 24 hours, it went up to 2000 and then after one week it went to about four now it's at almost 5000 so now what i've now what i've done which is another thing is when you start social media it can be overwhelming because there's so many options i decided to just learn instagram get really good at instagram and now i'm venturing off to tiktok and i've been able to manage it better time wise in that way so this is after one week at 4500 so really in a matter of a week that's almost 5000 people so what i've realized about tiktok is that i feel like the growth is a little bit quicker because Similar videos, catchy, catchy videos on Instagram have not, have not grown this quickly. Um, and so how did that happen? So essentially I read the room. So I looked at insights. So these are insights on TikTok that you can look at. You can see where people are coming from. So at the bottom where it says video views by section, the for you page is where your discovery is. Um, and so that's where people are coming from, the majority of people. Um, I'm looking at average watch time and what people like. So I kind of am adjusting my content like that. And I'm truly still learning, but I'm truly like investing a lot of time in TikTok because what happened when this, when we had, when I had the spike in followers is I got, you know, our web increase and in consults like doubled um, immediately. So my patient coordinator was like, what happened? Because we're getting like a ton of web increase. So this is, so, you know, the question is, is TikTok worth it? Yes, when done correctly, because it does increase your increased consults and, and patients. So I've actually gotten quite a few consults from this and it doesn't cost anything financial. Of course, it's your time, but there's no financial cost. Um, now, something else happened, the social media funnel. So um, this is I just wanted to show kind of my the growth on TikTok. So you can see like all these people are coming in. But then I went to Instagram and I noticed I had all these new followers. And then I went to YouTube and I saw that I had all these new subscribers. So it's a funnel where each one is feeding one because people see you on TikTok and they're like, let me go see what she's like on Instagram. Cause Instagram has a little bit more, you can put longer captions and kind of describe who you are a little bit better. And then they go to your YouTube. So it's all a funnel. So you wanna make sure if you're on TikTok that you have links to your social, your YouTube and Instagram and Instagram likewise, the way I, the way reason I use a link tree is because I can put my YouTube channel on there because Instagram gives you an option of one link. So you wanna make sure that link counts. Okay, and then insights, you know, just, just about using your insights for social media, you essentially are your own beta tester and your comparison is you. So um, when you think about the amount of saves, shares, comments, and likes, you know, if for you having 10 saves is a lot, then it's a lot and listen to that and produce that content. Someone else may have 1000 saves, but they may have, you know, triple number of followers. So you don't want to say like, oh, because I have 10 and they have 1000, I'm not doing well, or this is not a good post. It's all about what's good for you. Um, so what basically what I'm looking at here on the slide, that's kind of the, vi the video, this is looking at posts and you can look at posts by likes. So this shows you the post that had the amount of likes. You can look at it by comments, um, reach, save, shares, profile visits. So this is looking at website tabs. I love to look at website tabs because I'm kind of into this idea of like pay-per-click. And so you can see that, you know, these are the videos that had the most of that. So it's so important to use your insights and you can use that from your home page. And then each time you post, you can actually click on the insights button on Instagram specifically. Let's see. And then again, this is kind of looking at, you know, ideal times to post and things like that, audience location, what, what and tells you what your audience likes. You know, you, you're not gonna walk into a room and everybody's silent and then you just start singing. So the idea is that you're reading the room of your Instagram. So like, let follow your insights because that's only gonna help you grow. Now, just this kind of showed me that people really like video because what I noticed was the Reels interactions, IGT video and live videos had a whole lot more interactions. So Instagram specifically, TikTok is all video, which tells you something. 
Instagram um, is going towards favoring more video. So using video is so important um, in this day and age because that's Instagram is going to prefer that. Not only are your people going to prefer that, but Instagram is going to prefer it too. So attention spans is why video marketing is really good, but also it's about reading the room. You'll find most likely that people like video. Um, it also produces shareable content. You know, think about your content and, how, and the quality. What is it giving people? Is it making them laugh? Is it making them feel good? Is it inspiring them? If it is, generally what happens is they're going to tell their friends. Their version of telling their friends is sharing it to their story because they're friends with their followers. And so this is just an example of public reshares of certain posts that I did that I stopped and think of, thought about, well, what made these posts so shareable and trying to reproduce that? Um, and this is just a recent, I just went and took a screenshot of mine. And so you can see here, pretty much it's all video except for one picture post, which is really different from how it was a year ago where I did mostly pictures because I'm just, I'm very much like, I'm like about following the trends. Um, the other hint for videos and reels and TikToks and things like that are trending sounds. Trending sounds do really well. You don't have to like get up and dance and point if it's not you, but just use, you can use the sound for anything but it really does help to do that. And then these are just some helpful apps like that can help you. InShot is really good. It's a, it's a free app as our photo grid for making um, videos or like stills with one video and one picture. And those are apps I really, really love and use for, for my videos. So social media ads, just kind of wrapping up. Social media ads is something I like to talk about because I use this quite a bit. Um, Facebook is really the place where you create your ads if you're creating a, a, social, a sole ad for social media like the one in the middle. This is actually a post that I promoted on Instagram. So on Instagram, you can promote any post except for if it's a before and after post because they don't they they ban that pretty much. Um, but this is just kind of showing you insights from one post um, that I promoted was basically like something I baked. Um, and what I what you can look at is how much came from a promotion versus how much came from a website, um, and then how many follows came from that too. This is an ad that I created just for social media. The nice thing is when you create it on Facebook, what you can do is actually click it so you can go on Facebook and Instagram. So the ads are cost effective, they increases your reach. So you get followers that aren't, you get people seeing your content that aren't your followers, which is harder and harder to do intentionally because they want you to buy ads. Um, and then there's, those are kind of the options. And the goal is you can pick different goals. You can get more website visitors, get more leads. So people fill out forms where they actually put their contact information um, versus if you just want people to go to your website. So this is a dashboard that I created for that I just wanted to show y'all. And this is an ad I did, $50, 11 lead. This converted to five consults and three surgeries and I spent $50. And then this one, I wanted more website visitors. visitors so it, I got 283 website visitors and that was about 70. So it's very cost effective. I do all my ads myself. It's a little more cost effective than some companies offer to do it, but I'm just, um, you know, just getting comfortable doing it myself has kind of been just more effective for me. So hashtags, are they useful? Um, so the reason hashtags think about hashtags is when they're used correctly, hashtags can be very useful. Um, you want to use consistent hashtags like over and over and over because what happens is patients will search for their plastic surgeon by the hashtag. So they'll look up like natural plastic surgeon or many people search the board search by plastic surgeon. So I always use three constant hashtags. And what happens is, like I'm showing here, you show up repeatedly in that hashtag. And so, you know, it naturally piques people's curiosity, like, why is this person always showing up? And that's how they get to your profile. And, you know, that's how you get more reach. Um, and then here you can see hashtags brought in about 2,500 new people just seeing content. So you need, insights are so important because they'll show you what worked. If you have a hashtag that worked well, go back to that post and see what hashtags you use to see how you can reproduce that in the future. So some of the take homes are just branding, the important questions to ask yourself, it comes as you go. I figured out my brand as I went. Um, uh, consistency is everything with everything. Consistency is going to compound the same thing as inconsistency is going to compound too. You just want to be reliable. If people see that you're reliable, then they're more likely to, you know, convert to patients. Um, and then start with a one high, if you want to just start somewhere, start with a one high yield social media and just get really good at it. And patients are really coming to see you, even if you're, I'm in, a, I'm in a practice here, but patients come to see me or they come to see my partner because of the connection that they formed. It's rare that patients just call and say, I'll see anybody. And then the other thing we don't talk about a lot is just believing in yourself and realizing that being done is better than being perfect. Social media can be a little bit scary because it makes you vulnerable. You're kind of putting yourself out there. Um, but it's so important to do if you want to grow and kind of reach those goals of just 
really getting busy um, quickly, especially for me, which was really important to me starting off early in my career. So, and then I, I did, I ventured off into a little bit of that kind of product sales. And once I realized I had a very monetizable audience and I did that um, as I realized that my brand was kind of reaching farther than plastic surgery. So some people follow me because they want motivation or recipes. Um, so it kind of has gone beyond that. So thank you all. And this is all my information. Feel free to connect with me via email with questions or through social media. Thank you so much. That is fantastic. I had so many questions. I'm going to throw up a poll real quickly while we uh, ask Dr. Kim to pull up his slides. I'm going to table all the questions until the end just to make sure we have time for the presentations. But wonderful presentation. Um, uh, very thought provoking. We've got some questions in the chat box, which we'll, we'll absolutely get to. Thank you so much for sharing all of that very rich experience. Um, Dr. Kim, I see your slides are up and we've yes. got a poll in the chat box here. If anyone uh, can just kind of take a quick second to respond to that while he's getting ready. Okay. And can you hear me? I should be unmuted. Yes, you are coming in loud and clear and anytime you're ready. Thanks, Dr. Kim. Well, thanks so much. That was a fantastic presentation by Mwakwa, and thanks so much for inviting me for ASAP, AS, excuse me, ASAP's The Gems Talk, and special thanks to our uh, sponsor, Allergan. So they wanted me to talk about something a little different and specifically social media trends not related to TikTok, and also if you're a beginner, as well as you're more advanced, how to grow. So what's been happening, I have no disclosures. Um, What's been happening with social media is that they do hit certain demographics. So you should sort of figure out what you like to do and then figure out what social media platform works best for your ideal demographics. And TikTok, instead of reading the whole slide, the bottom line is that TikTok is a very rapidly growing social media platform and it definitely skews younger. So if you're trying to talk to facial rejuvenation patients or stuff like that, you may want to veer more towards less invasive procedures. Uh, a lot of the procedures, I'm sorry, a lot of the people and demographics on TikTok really will not be necessarily registering with you, but there are other social media platforms which may be a better fit. Instagram has grown like wildfire recent, uh, in the past and recently starting to slow down. It's actually slowed down a little for plastic surgery and aesthetics as well. We'll get into that. But there are still a huge number of installed users that use it a lot. And this is sort of the middle ground and it is a great, great platform in general. Next up is Facebook. And this definitely skews a little older. So if you have slightly older patients and old in the world of technology and social media is more like 30s, 40s. So not that old but Facebook is a great place. Facebook um, definitely doesn't love plastic surgery. They don't allow as much uh, body imagery before and afters to be shown. And that's reflective in posts, in content, in ads, in everything. So there are a couple of workarounds that we'll get to that. But the bottom line is Facebook, in my opinion, is for a different demographic, but also people are using Facebook more for news they still share a lot of stuff. Um, and I don't think that it's quite as hot in terms of plastic surgery, unless you modify Facebook or use some of the features. So you definitely should pick your social media platform, whatever you pick, you want to devote some time to. And I'll get into this a little later, but these companies are owned, the social media platforms are owned by different companies. You may want to cross-link them. You may want to actually become better at two separate social media platforms where the parent company is completely different. That way you sort of diversify your risk. You could definitely repurpose your content to different platforms, but you want to have diversification just in case, geez, we've all heard about it. Instagram outages, maybe certain platforms don't like uh, before and afters as much as others, things like that. So I think the minimum requirements would be consistency and also pretty pictures and, photo, and photos and videos. Consistency is really all about consistency in appearance, consistency in social media content creation, your upload schedule, your effort. You shouldn't just post something just because you feel like it. You should post it because you think that it's worthy of posting 
and it is your best effort. A lot of this, I think, is related to your energy levels and your enthusiasm levels. We all love plastic surgery, and sometimes we've lost the love, but what we really do is magical. What we should really focus on is, hey, it took us a long time to get where we are, and a lot of the stuff behind the scenes, patients, consumers, average person, just they have no idea what we're doing. And so the fact that we can show before and after and maybe some of the steps behind it, truly, a lot of people in general think it's magic. So I think we have to sort of rekindle that enthusiasm and suddenly finding content and talking about it every day. Well, it's part of our job anyway, but it's part of our passion and what we really enjoy. The pictures and videos should also be pretty. Specifically, the minimum should be, you know, get the blue and gray background. That way you have before and afters, which are consistent for ASJ, journal submission, uh, and, and things like that. But honestly, um, some of the intra-op stuff, patients want to see it. But to see it all the time, not necessarily what they want. Interestingly, psychologically as well, I think that patients don't really want to see all the time. Patients in makeup, perfect lighting, the perfect result. Because what they want to see is, okay, what's realistic? What's happening during the healing process? What's recovery like? What do I look like in terms of really boring clinical plastic surgery office photos, as well as, hey, I'm dressed up. That's really what they want to see because they want to see sort of all aspects of it. So be unique. Well, what does that mean? What are your favorite procedures? What are some hobbies that you like to do? And finally, what can tolerate being placed on the front page of the New York Times? So those are the things that I look for before posting on social media. We all know that social media is heavily filtered. It generally presents a pretty happy view of our lives. And we all know that not everything in life is very happy, but the positivity as well as, you know, some aspect of your personality are all important. To me, and, you know, this has already been talked about in the last presentation was engagement. To me, social media is social. One of the most important parameters, honestly, is engagement. So in plastic surgery, we want to engage with patients. We want to have them come in and see us. We want them to be happy. We want to communicate with them even after surgery. I've, I, found it, I found it a little less weird, but when I initially started doing social media, I find it odd that people would DM me uh, after hours for post-op recovery instructions. I would think that they'd want to call me or text me or whatever, but people enjoy a certain platform and they think it's totally normal. So it does mean a little more work, but it definitely means you should definitely um, pay attention to the DMs, to the texting, to various social media platforms, to your notifications on your smartphone to make sure that you're actually interacting with patients and talking to them. Another big thing which is already alluded to is content that can be saved or shared. So anything, not just where patients are coming in the door, but patients that actually come to my office for a consultation and they've saved certain images of what they want. That means to me, hey, I have a running head start. I already know what their end result aesthetic idea is. And that really helps me with the planning. And it has rarely help me with, you know, unfortunately rejecting some patients because they think they have unrealistic expectations. Interestingly, the vast majority of the patients that I see, they have very, very realistic expectations and the pictures definitely confirm that. So definitely the trend is more video, mobile videos cutting into TV, um, all types of video are cutting into just static images. So you have to become a little better at using that video camera or somebody on your staff and preferably both. The trend is definitely slower growth because of a couple of reasons. So Instagram, the algorithm pretty much hates plastic surgery. There are a couple of reasons. A couple of years ago, it was easier to grow. Right now, it's a little harder to grow because they want us to pay for ads. There are a lot of plastic surgeons with big social media followings already. There's this uh, push towards having maybe fewer before and after photos and videos placed on Instagram and definitely on Facebook. And I've noticed it. So you have to understand that plastic surgery in general may be plateauing or it's just harder to grow. So to overcome the algorithm, just like mentioned before, we have to look at the data. You have to measure it before you can manage it. So you could look at your insights on any social media platform. This is a sample of mine from Instagram. 
graphic surgical content, interestingly, doesn't get a lot of likes, but definitely gets a ton of shares or saves. So you have to look at various parameters as to what you're looking for. You have to know your audience. Um, any new features on any social media platform, use it because the social media platform spent thousands, tens of thousands of hours coding something. So they want you to use that feature. Any social media platform, all the features should be used. That will actually help you with the algorithm. You should be inventive. So whether it's selling skincare, being aspirational or motivational, talking about things in life, not necessarily related to plastic surgery. We, even within plastic surgery, talking about comparison of various filler products, the best way to do something, something that's a little unique. Those are things which will get more attention and help you beat the algorithm. You can directly in the caption, in the text, just ask for a follow, a like, a share, a save. You I think you'd be surprised at how certain content, it looks the same, but if you ask for it, the like, they will actually like it. And as always, pay attention to the social media marketing experts, which would include any teenagers you have in the household, millennials, or other people like that. You have to make your content your own. So I like to have consistent graphics, font, spacing. Uh, if you notice in my examples, this font and this light blue background is what I typically use for captions that I want to push. You notice that the uh, nipple areola covers are consistent with branding and imaging. And yes, I created it. Yes, it took me a couple seconds, maybe a couple minutes to do it. And it's really not that hard to do. I'd like to have consistent before and after imaging background because I think that yes, it helps with submission of articles, but also it helps with just getting patients psychologically to know that I'm actually a real doctor. We're actually creating real images that are sort of boring and clinical, but are very consistent. Even if you're not pushing that, if you have it as one of 10 images in a carousel, uh, one of like five images, you stick it inside a video. I think patients, they don't realize like, yes, we need a certain Pantone color for background, but psychologically, everyone realizes, oh, these are like very consistent photos with the same lighting same background, same filter, which is none. They're always looking at that stuff psychologically. And I think the mind's eye notices that stuff. Learning from others. Uh, these are just a bunch of things that I got from YouTube uh, yesterday. So in other words, if you're interested in Facebook group, growth, TikTok, Instagram, you know, doctors on social media, these are the top two results within YouTube. So they give good, great advice. And I don't know if you will be able to gain that many followers or fans within a certain period of time, but um, social media is so social. It's such a new field. Uh, good luck trying to read a book about it because the field is changing so quickly. There aren't any great books on what's happening in the past six months in social media. So you have to use social media to help you with your own social media. We talked a little about diversification using all social media platforms and all the features. So on Instagram, there's of course the main feed, but there's also Instagram TV, IG Reels, IG Live, IG Stories, sort of shorter form content. And if you use all of those things within Instagram, your growth should improve. With Facebook, I think the biggest thing that Facebook has, which a lot of things don't, is groups. So if you have a private group of your own patients, potential patients. If you participate in groups that talk about lasers, fillers, facelift, abdominoplasty, things like that, uh, you can be definitely surprised because you're definitely the expert. Uh, Twitter, they want more video content. They want more photos. It's not just reading all the time, but also they now have live chat rooms where on audio, you can interact with people from around the world through Twitter. TikTok is rolling out more features, and every time they roll out a new feature, Instagram seems to copy them. So it, you know, you get to save time because once you learn how to do something on TikTok or Instagram, it cross links. YouTube is following the trend. They have YouTube Shorts. They want more concise videos, and I would definitely cross link them all. So for continued growth, you want to do more and do something different. You need to diversify your channels. So of course, Facebook owns Facebook and Instagram. Google owns YouTube. TikTok's an independent company. So is Twitter. Google My Business is part of Google. Real Self, Yelp, and your own website are totally separate. So my suggestion would be if you're going to pursue two different social media platforms, 
you can tweak the content so it looks good on both platforms, but you don't want to just stick to like Facebook, specifically Facebook and Instagram. Maybe you want to do Facebook and YouTube. Maybe you want to do Instagram and TikTok, whatever. But you want to have two separate companies to diversify that risk. One of the big things which I think a lot of people can easily do, but is sort of not looked at enough, is Google My Business. Google, they love I mean, come on, it's the biggest search engine ever. It's a lot of SEO. And if you upload your hours, you talk about your business, you just have a bunch of before and afters, you know, blah, 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 video uh, screenshots, and you can talk about what you're doing as a business. This actually helps with SEO. You can also put patient reviews on Google My Business because they're total competition with Yelp and Real Self. And to me, that's pretty easy to do and doesn't require that much time. Uh, shopping in Instagram is growing like wildfire. So if you have anything that a product that a patient can buy, definitely strongly consider placing it on Instagram shopping. Yes, hopefully you'll get peripheral income, but also it really helps with the algorithm. And I think a thing that even I overlook and a lot of people overlook, we're creating content and we're getting some direct marketing benefit we should also update our websites. So in other words, we're working hard so that some tech company has tons of content and they run a bunch of ads and harvest all of our personality characteristics and you know identity characteristics to sell ads to other companies. We need to focus on our website so that way we actually own and control some of that content that we're creating. To me, YouTube's the final frontier. It's a huge video engine, but it's also a massive search engine. It's actually the second biggest search engine behind google.com. And it's hard to create good plastic surgery content on it because you sort of have to tell a story. It's hard to repurpose. In other words, you may be great on video on other formats, but you have to make it horizontal. Then you have to tell a story about it. Then you have to make sure that it doesn't get age restricted because a lot of what we do is sort of graphic. Even the before and after images I found out on, on YouTube, you know, do get age restricted. So you have to, you know, think about this. I think obviously you need a video editor, you need uh, extra video content, you need to tell some type of story. To me, this is the last frontier because there aren't a lot of plastic surgeons who, in my opinion, post great content that's horizontal for format, that's telling a story that's not just repurposed from Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and I could just go to their Instagram or TikTok channel. So uh, I would encourage you to follow through on this if possible. And that is it. So thank you so much for staying awake and paying attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Again, great presentation, so much to think about. I'm gonna dive right in with a few questions here and for everyone uh, with us uh, today, please go ahead and um, add your questions into the chat box. Uh, let's see, I'll, I'll go first to, I know uh, Megan Jack has asked a couple of questions. We'll start with, let's see, she's asking, how do you add the graphic content cover uh, over a video photo? I guess we've got a technical question if either one of you want to jump in and answer that one. Well, so in that, video, go ahead. No, it's okay, you go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, it depends on the platform, but overall you can create a video and within the video, you can add in a photo. So that way you can have it run for like three seconds, five seconds, whatever. People have no attention span. So I say like one to two seconds and say, graphic content's coming, be careful. Okay, great. A um, couple of things I wanted to jump in with as we have uh, a wait for other questions to come in. So you talked about uh, Google My Business, which I have to admit is not something that's really on my landscape. We're not using it. And, and SEO. Uh, I appreciate that you mentioned SEO. I think it's hugely important for so many reasons. Can you talk a little bit more, Dr. Kim, about the connection between Google Business, SEO, and you know why those things are sort of innately connected? We all want patient reviews and Google doesn't like, uh, they get jealous of other companies. So they're trying to totally annihilate Yelp, Real Self, any patient review site, health grades, healthcare review site, period. So with Google, my business, they put in Google reviews. They say they're helping your business because they'll make sure that your phone number, your address, all that's the logistic stuff is the same. And you can actually upload photos to it. So Google My Business is uh, pretty easy to do because it doesn't require much thought. And 
just doing it every once in a while helps with your Google presence in general. In the upper right corner on organic search, they typically push forward Google My Business. So that's why I suggest it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nuba, I love how you said done is better than perfect. I sort of live by that mantra myself. I think that's a Mark Zuckerberg quote, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I think that's a really good takeaway. And, and you spoke about being authentic. Dr. Kim talked about being original and creative as well. I think that's one takeaway here from both of your presentations is kind of be who you really are, be authentic, but also be a little bit different because wouldn't you say that it, it's easy to sort of get lost in the fray and uh, you've done a great job of differentiating yourself. So how, where did you find the inspiration to do that versus sort of just kind of slogging along and doing what you were kind of seeing? So what made you come outside the box and, and kind of rise up in the you know followings and ranks as you have so quickly? Right. I think so. I've like, you know, to me, authenticity, I thought about the accounts I like to follow and like people just, there's so much out there that's kind of like, you just see one aspect of something. And it was just like, I like what Dr. Kim mentioned, where he said, like, you, you know, talking about how long the training has been or behind the scenes, like people like to see people like to see all that. So truly, what happened was I did one thing that was sort of authentic. And like, a, a I do a lot of storytelling, <laughs> told a story about something, and I realized people loved it. I looked at my insights that people loved it. I said, okay. So it was a, it's a, it was, it's a little bit of fear, you know, stepping out of fear was a big part of it. I, I don't think we don't talk much about that part of it, you know, but <laughs> a, a big part of it was just stepping out of fear and saying, this is who I am. And it's sharing is also about sharing what you're comfortable with. You don't, people don't have to see every single thing, but they do like to see that you're a regular person. Um, and you, you know, you go for runs or you cook. And, you know, you live a, a kind of a, you're a normal person. So people like to see that. So truly it was for me following my insights and realizing this is what people like. I'm going to use my insights and read the room and just give them more and just step out of being afraid of truly not, you know, fear is really an emotional response. It's not like you're actually in danger. <laughs> so um, that was a big part of it. Yeah, yeah. And you both talked about the importance of insights. And I'm going to put up a poll in a moment here. But uh, if you can answer us in the chat box, before today, were you looking at your insights or your metrics? Was that even kind of on your radar? I'm curious to hear from the people that are on with us today, if that's something that they were, you know, even kind of paying attention to. So go ahead and answer and let us know uh, what your thoughts are about using insights. Uh, we've got a couple questions that have come in here. Let's see, Dr. U uh, Paul Udane is um, telling us that it was a great session, so thank you for that. Could you give us an average of how much time a day you spend and invest in social media and how much uh, per week or month? So basically, let's start with you, Dr. Kim. Um, per day, per week, per month, can you sort of give us an average uh, of how much time you're spending? Yeah, I mean, in terms of actual spend, it's about $75 a week for an outsourced worker. So they tweak my photos, videos for upload to multiple social media platforms and ensure everything goes smoothly. Me personally, I spend about an hour a day, um, possibly more, but about an hour a day on my own level. My patient care coordinator, I think that's her job. So in other words, yeah, she's a patient care coordinator, but social media intake, answering questions, people think, oh, it's on the phone. No, it's like through social media platforms, uh, texting, I mean, you know, whatever, email, phone calls, that's her job. So, you know, she actually does a lot of the creation as well as just answering patient questions. So, so you have a person that does this. Dr. Nuba said she's doing it all herself. Let's shift to you, Dr. Nuba. How many uh, hours per day, week, and month do you invest? Um, hmm. I say probably a day, it's probably a cumulative two hours. So I like between, like, I wake up early and then I reply to like DMs and things. And like, usually between patients and clinic, I reply to DMs and comments. And, and on surgery days, like between surgeries, I'll kind of reply to things. So it's probably a cumulative of two hours a day. And then, the, you know, as far as content creation, I have very much made that be like, not some, not something that feels extra. So like in the morning, as I'm getting ready, I'll like push live stream or I will shoot a story as I'm getting ready for the day. So I try and make that sort of thing just a part of my routine so it doesn't feel like I'm doing extra. It feels like it's, or feel like it's bogging me down or anything like that. Okay. Uh, and if I'm reading between the lines of Dr. Udain's question, it, it seems like he's asking um, for someone who, and maybe we can kind of convert the question, for someone who might not be very active on social media right now, um, 
is there a learning curve to sort of, you know, get up to the speed where you all are only spending an hour or two? Because I know people, and we've done reader surveys and polls where people are spending several hours. And, you know, I guess you kind of have to differentiate. Am I on my couch scrolling through TikTok at the end of the night leisurely, but also responding to DMs? So if you factor all of that in, how much would a new learner need to invest to be able to only spend an hour? Yeah, I, I think it depends. I mean, if you're really engaged and you enjoy learning uh, about a new platform, I think you could spend, you know, you could go down the rabbit hole and spend beyond too many hours. I think that if you're really focused on business, you're still going to want to spend some time on it. And just as a professional, uh, it's very weird, but I don't watch that much TV in general. But also, I'm not looking at my laptop as much. In other words, my smartphone allows me to link on an article in some journal. It allows me to see, oh, how that surgeon does this proceed, you know, this technique, a little segment within a breast dog or a tummy tuck or facelift. And I'm thinking to myself, why is he doing it that way? Why is she doing it that way? And then I read about it and learn. So that's how I use um, social media. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nuba, anything to add on to that? Right. I, I, I agree with Dr. Kim. Like initially when I started and just trying to learn social media, I would look at accounts and just see what people, you know, just kind of see what people are doing. Um, so it was a little bit longer. And I but also had more time because I was just starting my practice. So I wasn't as busy. But um, I, now when I look at social media, it's more so looking for inspiration. So I do a lot of reels and videos. And so I look for trending sounds and like a, a dance that I'm seeing people do over and over and over. I'm like, how can I? And so a lot of, a lot of the content creation just comes, I'm kind of always thinking about it, but I'm not sitting there just thinking about it. I'm like doing something and thinking about, hmm, or going to sleep and thinking about, hmm, how can I use that sound for this? Um, and so I think once you kind of get more comfortable, with, it can be one to two hours a day, but initially it was a little bit longer. Okay, that makes sense. You mentioned reels. Um, I don't think we had reels a few years ago. I'm not sure if anyone um, is using reels. I I'd like to hear from you both what you're doing with reels. If you're, you know, uh, and what kind of made you decide this is important. I need to start doing this. So, Dr. Kim, let's start with you. I don't use reels enough. I should use it more. Reels basically is a different type of uh, video that Instagram has to compete with TikTok. And the bottom line is, is that since it's a newer feature, Instagram is pushing it further out in the algorithm. If you generate something on reels, it's going to be seen by more strangers than just video on your main feed or video on stories or anything else. Okay. And I'm seeing a, a nod of agreement. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. So uh, Dr. Nuba, you, you showed a picture of JLo and I think Rihanna and you said music isn't their long-term thing. So everyone kind of has a side hustle or side business, right? Something that you sort of need to think about when you're sunsetting. So, um, you know, can you see yourself years from now using social media in the same way, you know, uh, later in your career? Do you feel like Dr. Kim mentioned maybe some things have kind of plateaued? You know, where, where do you see yourself down the road in terms of your, you know, uh, staying up to speed with all of the different um, you know, technologies and using social media. Right. So for me, so social media started as just plastic surgery. I was educating on it. I was show before and afters and it sort of evolved into like motive. When I saw what, what I felt like people needed um, in terms of like, I would meet people who come from plastic surgery and they're nervous about it because they feel guilty. So I was like, I'm going to make a video about this or and I'm going to do a video where I'm like pointing at something on a reel. Um, and so it, it, it sort of has evolved to that, but it's also motivational, it's cooking. So I definitely see, I definitely see my social media as in the future thinking about something that I am making more monetizable beyond plastic surgery mm -hmm. um, and, sort of, and, and just entering in, into that space a little bit more. So for me, it's been, I've de definitely evolved into building a, 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 a larger brand um, on social media. So it's still plastic surgery, um, but some people come to see me because they felt like something was motivational you know, and then they looked at the before and after picture. So, so it's kind of become more like that for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Kim. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Nua, Nua uh, said it so correctly, so succinctly. And also they, it's, this is sound, gonna sound strange, but it's actually not that strange. They want, you, you're following, uh, you're generating your own tribe. You are having a niche because there are a ton of plastic surgeons out there. And so they're trying to figure out, okay, we got like 10, 20 board certified plastic surgeons that I could drive to. Okay, which ones am I going to pick? It's the one that you vibe with. It's the one that you have a strong feeling and connection with. And if you're very corporate and you don't really reveal much about yourself, it's not that you're a bad or good person. There's just nothing to hook onto. Mm -hmm. And it also works in reverse. So in other words, you know, 
for example, maybe you like really large breast augmentation, natural breast augmentation, small breast augmentation, whatever you're posting, that's what people are attracted to. Mm -hmm. So if you are that type of person that goes for maybe more extreme results, average results, natural results, whatever you want to term it, those patients or potential patients will follow you and find you. That sounds great. Um, we've got a question. Uh, you mentioned beating the algorithm. We've got a question about beating the plastic surgery plateau. And I think that um, Megan Jack is asking maybe perhaps across multiple uh, platforms. I don't think the question is specific to TikTok or Instagram. So um, can, can one of you speak to how you can beat the plastic surgery plateau and maybe summarize some of your takeaways? I think one of, one of the big things um, is Dr. Kim mentioned this in his talk is posting, you know, so posting, I, I post plastic surgery because it's also like reminding people, hey, I'm a plastic surgeon, you know, but um, I also post other things that are not even plastic surgery related. Like I might just post a reel where I'm dancing, obviously dancing like professionally, but dancing and pointing at stuff and no one even knows. I'm a, so I think that is a way to kind of beat it because you know, integrating plastic surgery with the other things that you are, the other things that you bring to the table, because there's so much that we bring to the table will help because the algorithm doesn't even see, I might not even mention plastic surgery in, in several posts. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of helped me kind of reach out to more people who are like, oh, you're a plastic surgeon too. Oh, I, you know, I thought about this. I've thought about my breast augmentation for a long time. Right. So, so that, that happens kind of too. title is a little more subtle and the, the dancing or the recipes, et cetera, or kind of what has attracted them and then they kind of come full circle. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kim, how do you- Yeah, I think uh, she just said it so succinctly and so correctly. And I think the big thing is what she said and what I said, consistency. So consistency as well as looking at the insights. So in other words, hey, be consistent, stick to once a day, three times a week, whatever you can commit to. And once a week, look at the data and see what works and what doesn't. Okay, uh, this is kind of a, a quickie because I want to be cognizant of the time, but I do have a couple questions. If you can both stay on and whoever wants to stay on a couple more minutes, because I think we're getting into some good territory here. Um, so what are you using for batch uploads? Are you using TweetDeck, Hootsuite, um, and how often are you kind of um, uploading your content in advance? I am using Loomly, uh, which is a pretty good uh, social media software. And I actually had to hire someone else to do it. I just couldn't keep up anymore. So whatever I'm posting mainly on Instagram uh, gets fed out to other channels within a day to, a, you know, one to five days. Okay. And Dr. Nuba? I'm more so, so I actually, I, I, I like batch make content. So I'll make five videos like in a morning or like on a, on a weekend and like change, like maybe have different clothes or something like that, change the clothes for them. And then I actually save, I just save that to like a plastic social media folder or a video folder in my photos album. Um, and so I don't actually use an app to pre post. I post real time. Okay. That's interesting because I mean, and again, like my le journal life is a little different than what y'all are posting. Um, but I like TweetDeck uh, personally because when I know I need to push something out, I can schedule it and then I don't have to think about it on that particular day and it just kind of makes life a little bit easy. I don't always batch upload like that, but when I have something, especially before a conference and you know there's um, you know, a, a, you know a, an event or a giveaway or a book signing or something. Um, so um, that was, uh, okay, that, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. You mentioned Dr. Kim that it's not taboo to ask for likes and shares. And I feel like, we all did that like years and years ago, like me, subscribe, upload, and you know, we see the kids, you know, the resident experts, as you mentioned, kind of doing that on, on TikTok and, and whatnot. But I, I, it was good to kind of be reminded that it's okay to ask for the like in the share, because I feel like maybe, at least in the work I've done on social media, I've pulled away from that, but you know, I appreciated that advice. And um, can you maybe speak a little more to um, you know, your experience there? Yeah, if you look on YouTube, they're asking for it on virtually every single YouTube video, which I find annoying. Now, having said that, if it's every other video, every five videos uh, on Instagram, maybe once a week, once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly think that share or save is a little more palatable to people than just like or follow. Totally up to you. Yeah, um, you mentioned, I think, uh, Dr. Nuba, you mentioned the saves and that you look at the saves in your insights. So um, that's not something that I've been doing. So I'm going to actually start to do that. But what metric and insights do you kind of measure yourself or your success of a certain post by most? 
and I'm gonna um, yeah. I'm about so I, my number one thing that I look at is website clicks okay. because of the amount of effort because inherently like people on social media don't really want to put that much effort into much you know it's in the the rate that they actually like click on the thing and then go to your pro it takes a lot of effort so I'm like gosh if this post can get them to like go to my homepage, mm -hmm. click on my website okay well I feel like I'm doing something right because it's so many steps mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's my number one that I look at and the number two would be saves and then shares saves and shares Dr. Kim is that consistent for you or do you measure Absolutely. yourself in another way no uh, I mean that engagement how are you define engagement, which includes not just patients coming in the door, but also future patients, save shares. I totally agree with Dr. Nuba. Okay. Um, this was on my list. It's now in the chat box. Uh, Sam New is asking about patient consent, um, getting that in advance. I think this is a, we could have done another hour just on this alone, but I'd love to hear, uh, Dr. Kim, we'll start with you. Um, any, uh, you know, what's, what's your policy when, some, when a patient comes in, do you ask for a patient uh, video, social media consent, one form covering everything? Do you wait until you've you know kind of booked the surgery? And then have you had any issues where they've given consent, you put up a pre and a post-op and then, oh my gosh, my sister saw it, pull it down kind of a thing. Um, and have you managed that? Yeah, knock on wood so far, nothing because it is in my main consent. And I actually repeat it verbally. I tell the patient, look, is it okay to put this on social media? So that's why so far I haven't gotten into any trouble. Okay. And Dr. Newberg, do you have a similar form or forms just for social or one all in right. So we have one like the intake form that says it's um, in office photo album um, website and then social media. But what I do is when they come back and if I'm going to use their, and I, I ask them first, hey, you okay for what you're on social media? And most people say yes. I actually have a social media, a separate social media form that talks about the long-term footprint of internet and social media and all that that I use. Okay. And have you had any issues where you put something up having, having gotten consent and then, you know, been asked to pull it down? Right. Not knock on wood. I have not. Okay. I'm knocking on wood a second time. Excellent. Um, what's the, the difference in cost for anyone who wants to purchase a Facebook or an Instagram ad? Are they basically comparable? Because I know um, you both talked a little bit about doing ads, but um, is there kind of a, a, a price point or is there is one more efficient or effective in your mind? I think it depends on your um, on your goals. So the price actually changes. So what you can do when you go to an ad is you can actually increase the amount of reach. So how many people are the ad are going to, when you do that, the price goes up. Mm -hmm. So it's incremental. I use both. Um, I'll use an Instagram, like if there's a really good, like well-performing Instagram post, I'll promote that. But I do like the Facebook dashboard because you can do a little bit more. So you can make, get leads where people actually submit their name, email, and phone number. So you can have contacts um, and you can manage it and kind of see a little bit. So typically I do most of my ads through Facebook, but when you, when you go on Facebook, you can actually have it run on Instagram as well. Dr. Kim? I don't know. And the reason why is my ad spends are so small that I can't really tell. So in other words, you know, Dr. Nubas showed that as well. We're plastic surgeons in a tiny local community with a tiny niche demographic. So my ad spends are like 30 to $100. So I just can't tell, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's fair. And you mentioned maybe 50 or $75 for some, you know, really meteoric post. Uh, last question, because I don't want to keep you, I know you've got to get back to your day job. Um, you mentioned, Dr. Kim, about the consistency, and, and you actually showed some blue backgrounds. This is something we talk a about a lot at the journal level, and I'm sure in your offices, you know, uh, as you're photographing uh, patients pre and post. I really appreciated the consistency of, and blue, I think, is kind of like the preferred color, if I'm not mistaken. At least that's what we kind of like. So um, I think that that, like you said, was sort of unconsciously, you're seeing the professionalism. You said, I'm a real doctor. Um, and I think that that's really an, an important takeaway for anyone here who's going to show pre and post-op to have that consistency, size, color, font, all of the things that you mentioned, I thought were that was a really valuable tip. Um, so no other questions here. Any other comments um, from either of you or any closing thoughts before we uh, let you go? And thank you for your time. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I hope you get started in social media. If you're more advanced, hopefully there's some pointers that you can pull from here. It's a rapidly changing, growing field. So this video format is great, as well as I mentioned before, there's no great textbook on it because it's changing all the time, like minute by minute, hour by hour. So keep up with the trends.
and Dr. Nuba. Right. So, I, you know, truly um, grateful to speak here today and thankful for all of you. And I, I hope some of the, hips, the tips really helped you. Um, there is so much when I was going through and thinking about it, there's just so there's just so much that we could talk about, you know, for hours and days and, and everything. But um, hopefully this help, help, helped you all. And my encouragement would be like, if you haven't started to just start, you know, I think sometimes we think and we think and it has to be perfect. And it's, you know, just just start and see how your audience replies and just read the room and respond accordingly. And that's how you're going to grow. Love it. Be fearless, be different, make a lot of video. Thank you so much to both of you. It's we, We've learned a lot. I appreciate your time. Um, great to have you back with us. And uh, we'll sign off there and we'll see you next month on ASJ Gems again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care.